Can I move on now then to uh, Dr. Uh, Kenji Takeda, um, who is from Microsoft. He's Director of Academic Health and Partnerships at Microsoft Research. Um, from his original expertise in aeronautics and astronautics, uh, he's moved into AI and health. And um, I'm sure we'll all be very much looking forward to him talking a little bit about uh, what AI is, uh, which I think many of us wrestle with, I certainly do, but uh, particularly how it can now be impl implied uh, in, the, uh, in the world of healthcare uh, and give better results and more human oriented results. So Kenji, it's over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me uh, just share my screen. Uh... There we go, thank you. Can you see that? That's fine. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Um, so we're in this amazing revolution around uh, computing. Uh, as we saw uh, just now, uh, what is possible today around using machine learning uh, for these observational trials, for instance, uh, is really would have been unheard of uh, just a few years ago. Um, and all of that is predicated on computer hardware. Uh, and the revolution and the exponential growth in computing power based on hardware uh, was obviously predicated on the uh, invention of the transistor. But it wasn't until it was possible to manufacture and package those transistors at scale that we really saw the exponential growth in computing power. So it actually wasn't until 1958 when Moore's law really kicked off uh, and we saw this regular doubling in number of transistors uh, and then the related computing power. And this picture represents that revolution that started in 1958. And it was the invention of the photolithography process, which means today manufacturers can print actually trillions of transistors onto a wafer in order to, to create computers and allow us, for instance, to have supercomputers in our pockets. And where we are today is at the cusp of a similar evolution, but for software. But today, in the main, when we write computer programs, 99% of the computer programs that are written today are done in exactly the same way that Ada Lovelace did when she wrote the first computer program in 1843. And that is to tell the computer what to do step by step. And so over the centuries, we've actually not changed fundamentally how we program computers even though we have this huge expansion in the available computing hardware uh, at our fingertips. And it was in the 1950s when Alan Turing, a graduate here of King's College, um, posed the question, can machines think? And ever since then, computer scientists and researchers around the world have been digging into that question to try and figure out whether we can actually create computers and software that could, for instance, mimic uh, human behavior. And so this field of artificial intelligence has really grown out of that revolutionary thinking. Uh, and we really are at the beginning uh, of what we call, um, you know, really a, a, a Cambrian revolution around this explosive growth in computing software, which is why this field of AI is so uh, terribly exciting. Uh, because it's really the software now that is becoming so important. Every industry, every company is now becoming a software company. If we think of automotive, if we think of retail, we think of financial services, we think of healthcare, all of these industries fundamentally are becoming software industries. But having to program computers line by line is not going to provide that scale of impact. And that's where artificial intelligence comes in. And so uh, Microsoft, 
um, both here in our research lab in Cambridge and our research labs around the world, but actually as an organization, um, we're really trying to empower every person and organization on the planet to be able to take advantage of AI. Um, but to do that, we kind of need to understand what exactly is AI. Uh, a lot of people worry about artificial intelligence. And a lot of those discussions are based around what we call artificial general intelligence. And so that is a, a system that really can replicate a human's behavior and a human's ability to learn across many, many different modes of learning and being able to put all of that together uh, and actually you know, being able to think as a human brain thinks. And that is really many, many decades away. Uh, and so what we tend to talk about today when we talk about AI is much narrower AI, uh, where it's focused on very, very specific tasks, uh, just like what we've just seen, the excellent um, talk and fantastic work um, being done by Jaja here in Cambridge. And so when we think about that artificial intelligence and we actually break it down, you can think about it like this. You can think about this top layer of intelligence, which is really perception. So it's trying to just uh, understand what we're seeing. Uh, so the trivial example there is, you know, recognizing a cat or a dog. Uh, speech recognition. So can we actually uh, pick out words when somebody is speaking? Uh, and then language recognition. So if you think about um, spelling correction, for instance, uh, and using artificial intelligence for that. And so this perceptual intelligence is really, really important. Uh, and if you think about, for instance, uh, self-driving cars, then, you know, the car and all of the sensors, uh, the cameras, the LIDAR um, has to really be able to pick out what's happening on the road, on the pavements, uh, and really be able to classify, uh, you know, people and cars and bikes and trees and road markings. So that perception piece uh, is, is, is obviously um, critically important. But real intelligence is what we call cognitive intelligence. So that is this bottom layer here of reasoning and understanding and interacting with the world. And that requires much more nuanced um, machine learning. Um, and machine learning is just one of the techniques, uh, one of the key techniques that, that's used in, in, in what we call you know, artificial intelligence systems, because artificial intelligence systems could be a robot that physically interacts. Um, and again, if we think of a self-driving car, uh, we can think about the car having context of the world around it. Um, and that's really this bottom layer, which is much, much more sophisticated. Uh, and really, that's um, where a lot of the research uh, is starting to make uh, big strides in uh, around those, those types of things. And clearly, this AI has huge potential for positive human societal impact. But as with any technology, people will only use technology that they trust. Uh, and in healthcare, um, is one of the key opportunity areas uh, for artificial intelligence. Uh, it's perhaps you know, more important than any other industry. And at Microsoft, we think very hard about trust. We say that Microsoft runs on trust. And when we think about AI, five years ago, we were thinking about the potential uses of AI, but how could those uh, be just managed in a way that ensures that the AI is, is used in the right way. And so over the last few years, we've developed these principles uh, around responsible AI. Uh, and since we uh, published these principles and have been working on these uh, for the last five years, we've seen many, many other organizations, both companies, uh, research institutions, governments, uh, come up with these uh, responsible AI principles, but fundamentally they're all very similar uh, and they're really based on these, these six sort of principles to make sure that these are fair and not biased against certain uh, members of society, for instance. They're reliable and safe, critically important in areas like healthcare or as we say with the self-driving cars, um, that our data is handled 
sensitively and in a secure way. And the AI is used in an inclusive way as well, again, to so that no members of society are excluded uh, unduly. And then critically, that the use of the AI, the development of the AI has a level of transparency and critically uh, accountability as well. Uh, and so these principles are fairly universal when you look across uh, at, uh, you know, the, the, the great work going on uh, around the world um, in this area of responsible AI, uh, that these six principles tend to hold with whoever, whoever you talk to, and it's a critically important topic. So just moving on to um, our research here at, at Microsoft itself in this picture, um, you may recognize, so we are at 21 Station Road um, and uh, been in Cambridge uh, for many years, since 1997 actually, as a research lab uh, founded um, by Roger Needham. And uh, really we think about transforming the world through deep research. Um, I've just put a little link there, aka.ms slash MSR Cambridge, uh, which goes to our, our lab website. And so you can find out more about what we do specifically here. Uh, and as you walk by, you know, we do have uh, screens in the windows and things. And, uh, and, you know, we do like to put information about some of our projects there as well. So um, if you're waiting at the train station, feel free to, to come over and watch some of those videos to find out more. Um, and when we think about deep research, we also think about our place in the world, um, in the research ecosystem. We're in Cambridge um, because of the excellence of the university and the ecosystem and the, the research ecosystem around the city. And we think about, again, research. And we often think, I think, as researchers, I was an academic and a faculty member for many, many years, uh, in this sort of linear way. So we think about, uh, often talk about basic research. So researchers like Mary Curie, who uh, was a, not only a first a woman to win a Nobel Prize, but won two Nobel Prizes. So uh, a fantastic scientist uh, who we think about as, a, as, a, as doing very basic research, uh, really understanding nature. And then we think about applied research and a canonical example there might be Thomas Edison, uh, who uh, had a very industrial approach uh, to research. But then somebody like Louis Pasteur shows up uh, and he's somewhere in the middle uh, because in 1856, a local wine manufacturer in Lille approached him and asked him to help him solve the problem of their beetroot alcohol going sour. Uh, and uh, Pasteur discovered that there was always this presence of a, a lactic yeast uh, whenever uh, the alcohol went sour. And as you know, he was then one of the three main founders of bacteriology and pasteurization, vaccination, uh, and many, many other fields really grew out of this mixture of basic and applied uh, research. And so therefore you can think about research less as a linear model and more as a, a sort of quadrant model. So when we think about that, we think, is there a quest for fundamental understanding? And is there a quest for application? So we think about Marie Curie, uh, where there is definitely a quest for fundamental understanding, but not necessarily really thinking about an application. And we think of Thomas Edison, who's very much thinking about the applications, but not really so concerned around understanding nature in more detail. And this is where Louis Pasteur comes in. He comes in in this quadrant um, where there's a quest for application, one particular uh, application in this, in this case, but potentially many, many others. But in order to solve for that application, there needs to be new fundamental scientific understanding. And so this is known quite widely as Pasteur's Quadrant. Uh, and we think about that as user-inspired basic research. So we are looking at fundamental understanding, but it's inspired by a real world application. And so when we think about what we do at Microsoft Research, we aim to transform the world and that means that there should be some real world applications 
But because we are a research lab, we do that through deep research. So what I want to talk about for the rest uh, of the time really is, is focusing on some of the health and life sciences applications that we've been looking at and some of the research that that's uh, required. Uh, so I want to start with a, a project that's been going on for about a decade, Project Inari. Uh, and it's really looking at the application of machine learning to medical imaging. Uh, so unfortunately, um, many of us, in fact, um, about 50% of the population in the UK at some point in their lifetimes, unfortunately, would be diagnosed with cancer. One of the ways of treating cancer is uh, radiotherapy. The other ones um, being chemotherapy, surgery, and then increasingly immunotherapy. About 40% of, of cancer patients are cured uh, with radiotherapy. Within England, um, uh, there are about 91,000 patients. The standard of care in, in, in England is uh, the target of 31 days from diagnosis to treatment with radiotherapy. But unfortunately, there is a big shortfall uh, in uh, the workforce of oncologists. Uh, and I think these numbers are even sort of pre-COVID. Um, and so within the research team in Project Inari, I looked at many, many different types of medical imaging applications at the beginning. Uh, and then working with our, our collaborators, actually Raj Jenner here at, at Adam Brookson at the university, um, looked at this radiotherapy workflow. So if you are um, put through radiotherapy treatment, then the workflow looks something like this on the bottom. So you would go and have a CAT scan, a CT scan. Then a clinician will have to look at these images. So a, a CAT scan will produce a number of 2D images um, of, of a volume, so 2D slices of, of the anatomy. Uh, and a clinician has to go in and look at each one of those images and on a computer actually trace around the tumor using something akin to Microsoft Paint um, and then trace around uh, the surrounding organs, what we call the organs at risk. Um, and that can take many, many hours, in fact, in complex cases such as head and neck cancer cases. Once they've marked up those stacks of images, they then get passed into a piece of software called the dose planning software. And here you can see what it looks like. The radiotherapy itself uh, comprises of a linear accelerator um, and very highly focused X-ray beams that are targeted at typically this is a hard tumor. And those focused high intensity X-rays will then damage the, uh, the tumor DNA and ultimately kill the cancer cells. So the dose planning software is then used uh, to look at the geometry of uh, the X-ray beams and how they can hit the tumor with maximum effect, whilst also avoiding any healthy organs that we want to avoid um, damaging. Uh, and then the patient would come into the, the unit, uh, have a, a quick scan just to align the patient, make sure everything's lined up, and then they would have these X-ray uh, radiotherapy uh, sessions, fractions they're called, uh, multiple times to... Um, try and kill the tumor. So this step in the middle, this 3D delineation, this image segmentation task is very, very label intensive. And that's where the NRI team said, can we actually use machine learning? Um, and actually uh, just uh, a few, in fact, no, a year ago, <laughs> now gosh, time flies. Last November, um, uh, the NRI team here in Cambridge um, published a peer reviewed paper uh, that looked at this use of machine learning for this radiotherapy use case. Uh, and they asked the question, uh, can machine learning models uh, achieve clinically acceptable accuracy? And I'll talk about what that means in a minute. And also potentially save time. Remember that segmentation step uh, is very, very time consuming. Uh, and so they ran uh, uh, essentially a retrospective piece of research uh, one of the, the unique pieces of this research was actually working with not just one hospital, uh, but with hospitals around the world, uh, including uh, Adam Brooks here in Cambridge, um, uh, uh, using a data set of anonymized uh, consented images, uh, going through all of the, uh, the ethics and um, requirements uh, to use this for research, um, but from different continents. So from not just North America, but South America, um, Australasia and um, the UK and also continental Europe. Uh, and, you know, usually data is only taken from one hospital. So it's very interesting here to use data from multiple hospitals. And 
excuse me. So the time obviously was taking to, 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 to you know, prepare the data and the team worked very hard to build out really a state of the art, what we call conv convolutional neural network with over um, 39 million uh, parameters. And then had to actually do quite a lot of work to um, kind of refactor the model so it could uh, be trained on many, many uh, graphic processing units, so not just one computer, but many, uh, so we could build a, a really big, accurate model. And so lots and lots of um, you know, hard work by the team here in Cambridge to do that. And so then looking at the performance, this just really to show what the, what the output looks like. The main data set uh, is the data from five of the hospitals where, uh, which we used to train the model. And so here you can see, um, you know, some of the shapes of the anatomies and, um, uh, you know, it matches um, the, the amount of anatomy quite well. The, what we call external data sets is actually data from three of the hospitals that were not used to train the model. So the model was then applied to these three um, data sets, having never seen data from that hospital. And what that is, while that's important, it means that those hospitals might be using different scanning hardware. Uh, so they might have different resolutions of images. Uh, they might use uh, different clinical protocols for how they actually um, prepare the patient for imaging, for instance. So, so it was really a tough test of the machine learning model. Uh, against these data sets from hospitals where, um, you know, hadn't, hadn't been trained on. Because typically the machine learning model will pick up features uh, and some of those features could be uh, hospital dependent. And so we were trying to remove that uh, factor from, from this um, exercise. And this just shows the uh, performance uh, of the model. So remember the, um, what we call internal data sets here are the, the ones where the model was trained on. So we would expect a pretty good performance. The DICE score is a measure that is a percentage essentially of overlap of uh, the machine learning model um, segmentation. Oh, excuse me, Mark, it's just going there. <laughs> uh, and, um, and the ground truth. Um, and, and so the DICE score really is, 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 a, is a measure of how good the model is doing. So for the internal data sets, we would, um, we would hope that that would be quite good. And what we were concerned with was that when this model was applied to a data set that it had never seen before and had been trained on, that the performance would really drop. And what you can see here in the graph is actually uh, the performance is pretty comparable um, to the performance on data sets uh, that was trained on. Um, so that it was it was tested on uh, these internal data sets, but we did hold out a data set. So, so it was this test is not on data that it had actually seen before, but it was data that it hadn't seen before, but was from the same hospital. So that's, uh, we always do a holdout uh, test set for, for when we do these model tests. Um, but how does it actually compare with uh, a clinician or a human expert? Uh, so the team also ran this uh, inter-expert variability analysis. So actually took a set of images, uh, show those images to three different clinical experts. Each one of those clinical experts then marked up the images by hand as they would do typically. Uh, we would then uh, aggregate those into a, a ground truth um, segmentation map uh, and then compare that with the machine learning model. And what's really interesting here is that the yellow uh, bars are the variation between the three different oncologists, okay? So if you have three people uh, and they do the markup, it's actually not perfect, okay? So you can see the dice score is not 100%. And, but what you can see is that the machine learning model here, radiomics uh, neural network um, in green, uh, actually overlaps very, very well uh, with uh, the human clinical experts. Now, some people would, would call this human parity. We often hear the phrase human parity for say image recognition or speech recognition. Uh, here in healthcare, we tend to, uh, prefer to use the phrase uh, within the bounds of human variability. So actually we know that humans, uh, when they analyze these images, uh, you know, look at them slightly differently. Uh, a, a very junior doctor versus a, a very, very experienced consultant, for instance, have different levels of experience. Um, and so here really we, we, we try and uh, compare the machine learning model to that, uh, that, that human expertise. And then remember that 
hopefully shows you the level of accuracy the model is able to achieve. And on that last slide, you know, we could see that it's it's uh, as good as we might we would hope for really uh, when uh, compared to multiple different clinicians. And then it was a question of well, does the model could the model save time? So this was just a research study. Um, but again, did uh, an experiment with some clinicians to actually look at 10 head and neck CT scans. So head and neck is one of the most complex cases for radiotherapy because there are just so many different uh, organs at risk. Um, uh, and also obviously the tumor uh, can be different places. Um, so they actually looked at 10 uh, CT scan sets uh, and uh, took about an hour and a quarter. This was actually not the full set. A full set of um, organs could take seven or eight hours. Um, uh, but here we just took a subset. So about an hour and a quarter, 75 minutes or so to do that. When we run the machine learning model uh, on GPUs, the machine learning model itself actually takes about 30 seconds to run. So if we were to compare the human uh, markup versus the machine learning model, the machine learning model running is about 200 times faster, but that's not good enough because somebody really needs to check to make sure the output of the machine learning model is okay. As we saw before, you know, that these things, it's actually hard to know what the ground truth is. Uh, and so the time we show here, uh, which is a little over five minutes, five and a half minutes, is the time taken for the machine learning model to run, but also for a clinician to go through and double check uh, that the machine learning model has come up with uh, good results. And if it hasn't, that the clinician can go in and actually correct the machine learning model. Because at that point, the clinician can be happy that this uh, could uh, potentially then be passed on uh, to the next phase of the, the radiotherapy workflow. So in terms of uh, potential time saved here, it's still about 13 times uh, faster. Uh, to put that into context, I was chatting to one of our um, clinical collaborators a few weeks ago, uh, and he was just about to sit down uh, to do a bunch of head and neck CT scan segmentations. And it was going to take him about four or five hours on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and he was just about to, to, to go and do that. Uh, but if he had this machine learning model in place, uh, he probably could have done that in half an hour, 45 minutes. So it really shows you the amount of time potentially could be saved uh, ultimately, so the clinicians could actually uh, spend more time with their patients, think more about the patient treatment plans, rather than sitting in front of a computer, literally clicking with a mouse um, around, uh, around these images. <clears throat> and as part of this research, um, we actually open sourced the software um, that we used uh, to train the model. Uh, we use uh, cloud computing, Microsoft Azure is the Microsoft Cloud. Um, and the NRI open source toolkit uh, makes it very, very easy uh, to train models and develop your own models. Uh, and actually, um, we have several groups uh, at Cambridge actually using this uh, toolkit uh, for their own research now. So, you know, it's, it's really great that we collaborated with the university and Adam Brooks Hospital, um, and also that this work is, is also being used and benefiting the researchers at the university. Uh, and very exciting news also is that Adam Brooks Hospital is taking uh, the technology, they've taken the open source toolkit, they've retrained models on their own uh, data going through all of the relevant ethics and governments at the hospital. Uh, and they're actually going through the process of having it certified as a medical device. It's actually going to be used at Adam Brooks on, um, on cancer patients um, very, very soon. Uh, and you can see Raj Jenner here. Uh, and colleagues uh, in the radiotherapy uh, treatment area at Adam Brooks Hospital. So going again, that user-inspired basic research, going through the, the, the peer review process very, very rigorously, uh, and now actually um, uh, by open sourcing the software, then we're empowering Adam Brooks uh, and actually other hospitals, Adam Brooks with Birmingham uh, University Hospitals um, uh, achieved a, an NHSX AI award to actually look to roll this out to four NHS trusts beyond, uh, so going beyond Cambridge uh, and Birmingham. So a really uh, deep kind of uh, use case around uh, AI uh, in healthcare that we've 
been working on for many, many years uh, here in the Cambridge Lab. I'm really more focused on the open source uh, software and community support supporting this project, for instance. And there's a there's a big team of researchers here um, who've worked uh, very, very hard uh, on Project Inari for, for, for many, many years and continuing to do so. So I just quickly want to touch on a couple of other projects um, that we've been working on, actually not just here in Cambridge, but as a global effort. And so one of the, the big uh, projects uh, we've been looking at is this mapping of the human immune system. So the human immune system is really the ultimate diagnostic tool. Um, the body knows how to detect disease and it knows how to react to disease. If we could map out that human immune system and how it works, it would really transform how we think about uh, the practice of, of healthcare and medicine. Uh, and so we've partnered uh, with a company in Seattle called Adaptive Biotechnologies to try and map out and decode the, the human immune system. So uh, if you go to, the, to um, a healthcare provider and they take uh, a sample of your blood, uh, in that blood sample, there are about a million T cells. Um, and each of these T cells is genetically programmed uh, to target a specific antigen uh, that your immune system is looking out for and monitoring. So what adaptive biotechnologies can do is they can actually sequence <clears throat> these T cells uh, and essentially get this printout of a million strings <laughs> that contain the information about the human immune system, what the human immune system is looking out for, what it's encountered in the past, uh, and how it might uh, tackle any uh, attack on the immune system. Uh, unfortunately, we don't understand what those million strings really, really mean. And that's where we partnered with Adaptive Biotech because as Microsoft, we're bringing our machine learning expertise and working with Adaptive to try and decode all of that information uh, in that blood sample. And ultimately, uh, if we're able to do that, uh, it has um, implications around uh, early detection of disease uh, and also potentially for different types of therapies and vaccines. Um, and so this is a very, very exciting project. It spans our research teams in Seattle, Adaptive Biotechnologies in Seattle, our research team here in Cambridge, and also our research team um, in Beijing in China as well. So it's a truly global effort because it is such a big uh, challenge <laughs> that we've taken on um, with our partners. And so we focused on uh, a number of specific disease areas based on both the kind of unmet, unmet need for early detection. Uh, so particularly with these types of cancers um, and also uh, the potential that there is actually sort of signal within the T cell response. So, so really these uh, five different disease areas were ones that were picked out uh, when the program uh, began. Uh, but as many of us, as we just seen, um, uh, pivoted and really thought about last spring, uh, what can we do um, to help with the, the world's response to COVID? Uh, with this project, uh, the team thought, can we do anything? Uh, and so they actually pivoted the research to look at uh, COVID-19. Uh, sponsored a, a study to collect samples from patients in the US uh, and worldwide. Um, and actually, as you can see here, um, again, applied this machine learning technology <clears throat> to see if uh, there was any signal <clears throat> that we could be picked out uh, using these techniques. Um, and actually just in March this year, uh, the FDA uh, provided emergency authorization uh, for this T cell test, uh, which can detect whether somebody has had COVID-19 in the past. Uh, and this is really important, for instance, because obviously we do have a number of different tests um, for COVID, uh, PCR tests, lateral flow tests, et cetera. Um, where this is really interesting is in, for instance, tracking long COVID uh, to see somebody had uh, COVID in the past because the, the human immune system remembers um, uh, antigens that we've encountered in the past. So um, again, a, a truly global effort working with our partners uh, in the research ecosystem and clinical partners um, uh, to try and look at the human immune system again from a 
fundamental understanding perspective, um, but also with applications uh, and you know, no more urgent application than um, COVID-19 and pandemic response. So I just want to finish off quickly talking about uh, another area of um, machine learning, uh, which is analyzing text. Um, so natural language processing and looking at texts, try and understand it. Again, I talked about perceptual intelligence. This is really that cognitive intelligence. Uh, and if we think about text within a, a medical and healthcare context, we can think of clinical notes. We can think of clinical trial protocols. Um, we can think of medical publications. Um, and so natural language processing will perceive, it will look at the words on the page, um, but then the cognitive intelligence is really trying to understand the context and structure uh, of, of that text. Uh, and so we have a number of different efforts at Microsoft and Microsoft Research. Um, one of them actually is, um, is being used um, quite widely uh, as a service, as a cloud service, Text Analytics for Health. Um, and here you can just see an example of some of the things that it can do around entity recognition and entity linking, um, whether an entity appears in a negative form. Uh, and it can basically be used, for instance, to sort of look at, um, say, a medical note and try and decipher that, basically, and pick out the important, important points. Um, and this uh, service is continuously uh, being improved. Um, and can be used uh, underlying other um, applications uh, like sort of bot services, um, uh, for instance, uh, or again, you know, the speech recognition, but sit behind the speech recognition to provide that cognitive intelligence. So this is something where we have a team actually based in Israel um, under Hadass, uh, who leads this team. And, and there are uh, many, many users around the world using, uh, using this technology. Within research, we have a research team. Here you can see Hoi Fung uh, Poon, he's based in Seattle uh, and in Redmond and, and Jan Feng, who are uh, natural language processing experts uh, and have been working around domain specific languages. So again, for biomedical uh, applications. Uh, and um, they actually did a webinar quite recently about the research that I'm about to, to tell you about. So. Um, if you are interested, do have a look at this uh, aka.ms um, bio and our web NLP webinar if you're interested in going a bit deeper. Uh, but what they were thinking about was most natural language processing models are trained, they need to be trained on a large corpus of text. And that large corpus of text uh, is often the World Wide Web. So these very general NLP models are trained on these very large corpus of text, which are not uh, domain specific, they cover many, many, many different topic areas. And uh, so they ask the question, well, what happens if rather than training on this very general um, set of texts, we call this pre-training, so we, we train a model on a very general set of texts, and then we run another set of training loops to then sort of make it more specific to a particular domain, and this is typically how NLP is done. Uh, so Heifeng and Jan Feng and the team kind of challenged that thinking and said, well, actually, what if we pre-trained on a large corpus of material that was very specific to a domain? Uh, and it turns out within healthcare, there is a, a very large corpus. Uh, so PubMed uh, has about 30 million uh, abstracts uh, of research papers. And then PubMed Central actually has millions of the actual full length articles. So there is this very large corpus of publicly available medical literature uh, that the team then used to train uh, what they're calling PubMed BERT. Uh, so if you actually uh, search um, uh, for PubMed BERT, you'll pull up uh, a bunch of news articles, but also the, the web page on this. So they said, what happens if we do domain specific pre-training from scratch um, so not kind of using the Wikipedia <laughs> and all those kind of articles as pre-trained, but use the very domain-specific uh, material, uh, would that be better or worse? Uh, and this just is part of um, some of the work that they published, uh, looking at, if we look at some certain biomedical terms in the left-hand column, BERT is the general sort of NLP model. Uh, cyber is one that's been developed more for scientific literature, and then PubMed BERT is the one that's purely trained on the domain specific piece. And what an NLP model will do if it has a long word is it might uh, basically split the word up. Uh, and so here what you can see really with the right hand column is that PubMed BERT 
because it understands these complex uh, words, uh, it actually can uh, look at the entire word. And what that means is it has more context, right? We talked about perceptual intelligence and cognitive intelligence. Uh, and so not only did they develop the new model, but they also created a new benchmark, this biomedical language understanding and reasoning benchmark, the blurb benchmark. So other people uh, could also uh, continue and collaborate on this work. And actually this model is, is, is open source, um, the PubMed BERT model, if, if anybody listening, uh, any of you NLP researchers want to, to dig in on that, please, please do and, and let us know what you think. Um, uh, and so again, we've gone beyond that as well in terms of real world application, uh, taking some of that work uh, around NLP that I've spoken and actually created a search engine. So this is uh, Microsoft Biomedical Search, it's a beta. Um, and here you can do uh, sort of web-like searching, so natural language searching and it will search through all the medical literature and pull up um, the relevant articles for you. Uh, and so if you go to ak.ms slash biomed search, um, you'll be able to try this out. And um, you know, for you researchers out there, please, please do use it again. Let us know what you think, um, because it uses some of that technology that I've um, just spoken about, but, but we've uh, basically been able to provide a, a very domain-specific search engine to help researchers. Uh, and scientists around the world, uh, because literally there are these millions and millions of uh, publications and, you know, with COVID uh, as well, you know, again, the whole medical and healthcare research community really trying to help and focusing on that just has been, this has been explosion of literature around COVID-19, you know, many, many great articles, but finding that can be, be quite challenging. So that was one of the reasons why um, we created this biomed uh, search um, as well as actually working with a number of organizations to release an open data set of the um, medical literature called COVID-19, um, partnering with uh, folks like the Allen Institute for AI uh, in the US. So with that, hopefully I've given you a bit of a flavor around AI, what it is, why it's important uh, in terms of this software revolution, um, and also how we think about deep research at Microsoft across our research labs, uh, and a taste of, of, of just three of the sort of research projects uh, and initiatives that we've been working on. And like I said, really, um, you know, our, our focus is around empowering others. Um, so you here at Cambridge University, uh, listening and within the ecosystem and anyone actually around the world who's, who's watching this, um, uh, you know, we really hope that the work we're doing uh, can help have a positive impact uh, to society. So um, thank you ever so much for the invite. Um, the website for the lab here in Cambridge, again, is ak.ms slash MSR Cambridge. Um, the, the website for all of Microsoft Research, microsoft.com slash research and at MSFT Research is our uh, uh, Twitter account. So um, I do hope that was interesting. Uh, and uh, thank you again ever so much for the invite to come and talk to you. Uh, and yeah, look forward to some uh, discussion and questions. Thank you. Kenji, thank you very much indeed. That was uh, fabulous. First of all, to to some extent demystify AI, but certainly show us how intensely practical this is in areas which are of great interest to to everybody, particularly those of us of a certain age uh, who are listening this evening. Um, I will, if I may, bash straight on with questions. And uh, the first one I think you may have answered but in the spirit of not editing, uh, I'll say it anyway. And this is, uh, I, I think you made a distinction between generalized AI and, and specific. But anyway, here's the question. Gordon C. Gregory, no relation, mm -hmm. says, um, hi, what is the extent presently or future of AI? Uh, you said that AI was human intelligence. The defining feature of human intelligence, I would say, was abstract thought rather than concrete limited problem solving. Has AI got the potential for such abstract conceptualization, et cetera? Where is it now? And uh, are we still at the extent of if then programming? It's a huge question, but there, there may be a concise answer. No, absolutely. I, I think that's where uh, what you're talking about there is really this, this concept of artificial general intelligence. Uh, and there, there's, there's obviously a lot of technical debate on there, uh, quite a lot of philosophical <laughs> debate about that as well. Um, and actually many uh, experts here in Cambridge um, can talk about it better than I can. Um, but as I said, you know, that, that quest for artificial general intelligence is really, you know, decades ahead of us. Uh, and really, uh, certainly here at Microsoft, Microsoft Research, we're sort of 
focusing on 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 sort of tactical pieces and you know as as research advances if we just look back you know five ten years and really it was these neural networks um uh combination of neural networks that really have, have, have um meant that the pace of research is able to to accelerate and then the application as well so so we do have you know this um evolution of uh, of the field um um, but yes, the general intelligence piece, which I think are all the things mentioned there, I think is, is, is quite a long way away <laughs> still. Yeah, that's reassuring. And some of the more apocalyptic views uh, of AI are around that generalized intelligence, uh, I think. But I, I very much liked your introduction of Pasteur's quadrant. That's a very nice way of showing that it's not an either or. It doesn't have to be basic or applied. Uh, it can be both, which people don't always recognize. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I have a question from uh, Richard. Um, uh, Richard asked, you talked about current software development being analogous to previous hardware development. Is there a software analogy to, for Moore's law? Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah, it, it is quite interesting in terms of um, kind of where we are right now um, with that. And, you know, one thing I would say with, with AI and certainly the approach we have is really kind of augmenting, you know, human, human capabilities. So. Um, one of the things that, that, that came out quite recently um, uh, is with GitHub. So you know, GitHub is part of Microsoft. Um, uh, and there's a service now called GitHub Copilot, uh, which actually helps programmers. <laughs> so when you're writing a program, it will actually assist you to write your program. Um, but with these uh, machine learning models, yeah, the idea is that, that, the, that you write essentially the neural network um, but then the neural network, as you give it data, will then train itself. If we think um, back in the old days, you know, the sort of um, promise of expert systems, <laughs> which was essentially sort of decision trees, they'd have to be sort of handcrafted. Um, uh, with machine learning, really, the, the, uh, the algorithm should learn based on the data, so it will actually learn itself. So, um, uh, so it, is, it is fundamentally different. Um, and it does provide that scale where you would write the machine learning system, but then the applications could be many, you know, uh, many fold. So, um, so we are at the start of that revolution uh, right now. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, everybody is, is sort of exploring it. So, so yeah, there's still certainly uh, some way to go. Um, but really, again, we're at that sort of cusp, I think, um, which is why, you know, there's just so much interesting when we look at the uh, you know, the UK's AI strategy, for instance, and you look at where that is, and, and, and it's just the potential is there. So, um, so really um, uh, exciting times for all of us. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Andrew Shepherd, who asks, when AlphaGo, uh, we think that's the right uh, label, used deep learning for the game of Go, it came up with better strategies than humans had managed to develop. Did your model manage to sharpen up the precision of the X-ray therapies so that lower doses could achieve more effective uh, cancer therapies, doing better than the humans, as it were? Oh, right, yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, and obviously AlphaGo, um, you know, is a tremendous um, piece of research. Um, so with the radiotherapy, we were, again, we, we picked off a very specific problem um, because we worked with the clinicians. So the key here, in particularly in healthcare, and the work we do at Microsoft, we say is human centric machine learning. So the first thing we do is we go and talk to clinicians and we say, okay, uh, if we could create some machine learning for you, how could it be most helpful? And so they basically said, this is a very laborious task. Uh, can you help? So that's the work we've done. Some of the other questions you've asked, um, I think other researchers uh, may explore. Um, but we haven't been looking at that as, as part of our project. Again, we, we focus down uh, really on a very narrow task, but a high value task. Like if we can if we can actually crack this one, it's going to make an impact. Um, and so that's kind of what we looked at. But, you know, there's a huge amount of research around uh, radiotherapy. Um, and um, and again, that was one of the reasons for open sourcing um, the work that we've done, because it's, it's, it's a pretty general toolkit for medical imaging. Um, and actually, you know, we're releasing other uh, open source software for machine learning. And so the idea is that, you know, if we're not looking at that problem, hopefully this helps another research team, uh, you know, do that and give them a leg up with, uh, you know, from all the work we've done. So again, um, you know, our ethos uh, tends to be to try and publish in the open literature and then also open source uh, a lot of our work. So, so we do hope that other people can 
uh, you know, if we're, I don't think we're looking at that problem specifically, but we do hope some of our work uh, can both inspire people, but also actually the open source tools will help them uh, do that work themselves. Great. Uh, D. Armin asks, uh, is immunosequencing on a single cell level? Oh, okay. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not <laughs> the expert on that one. So, so, um, uh, so um, I will have to pass on that one, I'm afraid. But do have a look at, um, if you do a search, if you just search for Microsoft Immunomics, um, you'll find all of our publications and papers on there, so you can you can dig in there and, and see if um, uh, see if you can find the answer there. So, <laughs> thanks. That's smashing. That's smashing. Uh, a signpost to the answer is as good as the answer. <laughs> um, Tessa Kilvington Shaw uh, asked, "Would the T cell T cell test differentiate between different variants of COVID uh, 19 uh, I think that's something they've been looking at actually um so again i think they they got the fda clearance on that and um uh again if you have a look at uh the immunomic site uh and there is there is some more information about that i think but but yeah i definitely um it's definitely of interest just in terms of um yes those different variants so i think that's uh again it's a again it was a, it was a pretty big effort to try and do that lots and lots of different questions to answer so i think they, they were again pretty focused on on what to put out but i, I Definitely, I did see something about the variants in there. So do do have a look at again the same site, you know, the immunomics, uh, Microsoft Immunomics site uh, to see what um, what the teams uh, put out about that. Great. Uh, John Scott asks, what do you think about using AI as a substitute for a visit to a GP? Ah, <laughs> ah interesting. Okay. Um, I guess there's a, a couple of different things there, really. Um, and again, it's thinking about it from uh, a human centric uh, perspective. So one of the things uh, actually the team had asked um, uh, with the text analytics, um, they created something called the health bot. So the health bot is a little chat bot. And they've been working on that for, for quite a while. Um, and there was quite a lot of uh, general interest in that. And um, what happened when COVID hit uh, was people were asking Microsoft to help. Uh, and one of the challenges actually was um, people wanting advice. Um, and so what they did was they actually created a, a template for COVID-19 uh, sort of questions and answers. What they did was they, it was actually in the US, they took the US uh, Center for Disease Control uh, sort of tree, you know, so when you phone up a, a call center, they go down a little tree. And it's a very well-defined sort of triage tree. Uh, and what they did was they took that and they actually instantiated it into this health bot. Uh, and actually uh, what that meant was it took a huge load off uh, a lot of the staff, a lot of the nurses uh, who were otherwise answering the phone <laughs> on, a help, on, a, on a COVID helpline. Uh, and so that actually was deployed in the US uh, uh, by CDC. So if, you, if you're in the US um, and uh, you want to know about COVID symptoms and those types of things, you could go to this, the, the CDC website uh, and actually you would encounter this health bot and it would triage through. So I think that's an example where it's not maybe, uh, you know, it's not definitely replacing the GP, but what's interesting is where we can use AI in a sensitive way and in a way that can help the system uh, to free up time. So we, we heard, uh, you know, the numbers were huge in terms of just the amount of time that was freed up um, for the frontline healthcare workers by deploying this bot. Uh, I know there's a huge amount of work around telehealth and Microsoft does a lot of work uh, in that, actually using our Teams platform uh, for that. Um, and actually Microsoft Teams was rolled out um, across the NHS in a week. <laughs> Uh, which was incredible, basically, at the start of the pandemic, it was a huge effort um, between the NHS and ourselves uh, and our partners uh, to be able to roll that out. So again, suddenly having that platform available across the entire NHS, I think, is, is starting to help people now think through, um, maybe not the AI piece, but certainly using technology there, but the bot, you know, is an example there, because the bot, whilst it's a, it's like a tree, um, it has natural language processing because when you type in 
to a bot, you're actually typing in sort of human sentences. And so the, the AI is really that NLP to understand what people are typing um, in order to then, you know, go down the triage. So, so lots and lots of different applications, um, uh, like I said, but having to be very uh, careful, certainly we, we, we think um, to be very careful that it's done in a, a human centric way, both for the importantly for the, the the person you know be that potentially a patient or citizen and also for the the, the healthcare workers or the, the healthcare system as well so having to make sure that again and this all comes under that you know as I said at the start under responsible AI you know that's when we talk about responsible AI that's what we mean uh, in the sort of healthcare setting. Great <clears throat> thank you um an anonymous attendee, I think that's a name, I think that's an anonymous attendee. Um, how does your approach contrast with Google DeepMind in terms of advantage? I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but have a go, please. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I can't really speak to, to what Google and DeepMind are doing, really. So, um, as I say, I can just reiterate that, um, you know, our principles are really around, um, you know, empowering organisations and, and people. Um, and also, you know, a big focus on obviously the responsible use of AI uh, and, you know, with our lab here in Cambridge and labs around the world, really kind of pushing the boundaries of, of research. Um, uh, and again, you know, we have dedicated teams to healthcare here. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's what I would say, really, I can talk about our approach, but I can't <laughs> really comment on on, on um, uh, you know, what Google and DeepMind are doing. No, I think, that, I think that's fair enough. <laughs> uh, it's a bit like asking Rolls-Royce how GE engines work. Isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Charlie Wartnerby uh, says, uh, great talk, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Pub, PubMed Bird uh, yeah. had enough domain-specific data to train from scratch. Yes. Was the radiological imaging model also trained from scratch or was it based on pre-trained image recognition model, i.e. transfer learning? All oh, right, good question. No, that was trained on um, trained from scratch. Um, so in the paper, you, could, you can see we use prostate and head and neck scans. Um, I think it was about 500 images or something. I mean, that's one of the, the challenges in um, healthcare, actually, is, is the, the data. Um, uh, and obviously that data, you know, sensitive data, so it has to be handled um, with care. Um, uh, but the, obviously there is a lot of work on transfer learning. There's some very interesting work on um, sort of generative models. So can you create synthetic um, images? There's some really nice work from King's College London, for instance, um, uh, generating sort of synthetic images. Um, we actually did uh, something similar um, Microsoft, um, where um, the lab here in Cambridge worked very closely on the Connect body tracking. So Xbox released this um, sensor that could detect basically what you were doing. So you could play the Xbox without a controller. <clears throat> That's now what we call Azure Connect. Um, but in order to do that, they actually had to film people moving around. Um, but they actually used sort of 3D modeling software to create synthetic people, <laughs> sort of mannequins. Uh, to create training data. So, so there are lots of different ways you can try and overcome uh, the challenges of, of data availability. But yeah, transfer learning is definitely a, uh, a very active topic um, within imaging. That particular study uh, didn't use it, but you know, there, are, there is work going on in, 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 in that and related areas for sure, absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, now I've got one more question on the screen. If anybody is feeling shy, um, uh, but would like to ask a question now would be a good time to uh, get it on the q a if you will uh, but uh, makoto ueki uh, says thank you for your talk uh, i might have missed that part which was uh, which was better in performance mixed domain pre-training or just domain specific pre-training and what do you think is the implication of the result yeah so in this case the domain specific training uh, appeared to be better um uh, so, you know, you can have a look at the, the paper that details that out. But that, that again, was the thesis there was um, because, and, you know, it does have implications, for instance, in areas such as finance, or, or if you want to train models, um, you know, in the legal domain, for instance, uh, where there's very, very specific language and phrases. So, so that was really um, what they were exploring. And the nice thing here, of course, is because PubMed is a, a publicly available data set. <laughs> Uh, they could could train on that data so so yeah that was exactly the question they were asking themselves um uh, and um uh, as, as you you know you'll see if you, you read that or i think watch the webinar 
um, you know, they'll go through that in a lot more, a lot more detail. But, but yeah, absolutely. So still pre-training, but pre-training on the domain-specific material um, is is what they uh, what they showed there. Great, thank you. Um, Kit uh, asks. Um, sounds if like somebody's been involved in this kind of thing in the past. What percentage of total staff time was spent on getting permission for the images versus programming? <laughs> oh, right. Um, sure, that's a good question. So I think, you know, we always um, follow the relative, uh, you know, the right procedures with with, with each of our uh, collaborators. So, um, and, and, you know, we, we're very, very uh, careful with that. So it does take time, for sure. Um, but it does take time because... Obviously, we want to do everything absolutely properly, and then we also our collaborators are doing everything absolutely properly. So, um, so it is one of the the things within healthcare research. Um, one of the things we are doing, working with the community, is to help them release data openly. So we did um, a partnership with Stanford University, the AI uh, Medical Imaging Group. There, they hold one of the largest medical imaging open sets of imaging data in the world. Uh, and actually, we work with them to build out a new platform uh, using our cloud um, to, to access that. So, um, uh, again, you know, one of these challenges is 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 um, data for, for this type of research. And so we are uh, working uh, again in, in that sort of open science uh, domain. You know, like I said, we, we very much believe in open science. Uh, we make sure our publications are openly available um, to anyone and on the open source software and then on data, again, working with partners like Stanford to, to open up data sets to make it available for researchers around the world. Great. And, and so this had better be the last question from John Scott, who says, uh, does the AI tend to develop false positives on cancer diagnosis or are false negatives an issue? All right, so we, so, so we're not doing diagnosis. So, um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, a classification problem rather than less image segmentation problem. So, um, so we're 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 not doing that with, with this piece of research. Um, but it, obviously, it is very important uh, to make sure that you you balance that out and that you understand uh, what your false positives and false negatives are and the implications. But I mean, yeah, that, a lot of the work at the university, um, for instance, in that area. Um, you know, Fiona Gilbert, Evasala, you know, Carola there, um, yeah, real world experts, Mahela van der Schaar, um, experts at the university there who are looking maybe at some of these more diagnostic tools um, uh, and, uh, you know, are very well placed um, to answer those types of questions. Um, so, you know, you saw one of my own uh, students there, she may be able to comment uh, better than me. Um, so, yeah, but absolutely, you know, in healthcare, um, again, those things, you know, critically, critically important. So, um, yeah, have to be really handled with care. Well, I promise you that last one, but a rather interesting question has just come in. So this really, really is the last one uh, from Bill McGough. Uh, a question on AI accountability and interpretability. Mm -hmm. In contrast to the algorithms in Project Inner Eye, radiologists would be able to conversationally describe their rationale behind pixel level labels. Mm -hmm. Do you think that research that takes steps towards increasing AI accountability, where perhaps algorithms generate logic from computational perceptions, similar to a radiologist explaining their rationale, could also advance the abstract cognitive capability of AI? Wow, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think that's a, I mean, it's a really, really interesting topic and, and point you raised there really is, um, yeah, where are we with uh, interpretable ML? Um, with images. I think what's interesting as well as kind of multimodal data when you look at say an image, but you also look at the radiological report and then yeah, can you generate a radiological report from an image? Um, I think these are really just very active uh, areas of research. So, you know, and um, again, you know, great example of, of you know, sort of Pastor's Quadrant where you've got this real world example, but there's a lot of really deep machine learning research and, you know, many of the things that you just mentioned there, I think are unsolved problems. So. Um, which for us as researchers is exciting. Um, so I think, um, I think yes, there, there's a lots of prospects there, um, but I don't think that we're, we're not there yet, <laughs> um, uh, for sure, but, but definitely those are very active, active areas of research. Fascinating. Well, Dr. Keda, thank you very much. It's been a, an exemplary CSAR talk. You've taken us uh, from an easy start uh, <laughs> through to some absolutely leading edge 
uh, research uh, and its application. I think we feel a little more aware of what AI is, and, and, and it's not just about sci-fi, uh, but intensely practical. Uh, and it's been very helpful also to get the sense of the nature of your research. The Pasteur's Quadrant story is a good one, and I'm always pleased when people point out that research doesn't have to be uh, applied or pure. It can be somewhere in between. Uh, and your company, and of course, your work is a great example of that. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, great to have you uh, speaking to us. Can I uh, thank all our speakers? You'll gather from the range and depth of questions uh, that you've uh, engaged our audience uh, brilliantly. Thank you for that. Thanks to our questioners. Uh, thanks to all the viewers. Uh, finally, can I remind you um, again that it's our Society AGM next time. It won't take a long time, but we're keen to have you there uh, on screen or ideally in person. Uh, you can ask us questions and, and see what's going on. Uh, I think you'll find we're in pretty robust good health, but uh, we look forward to being able to tell you about that. So uh, again, thank you, Kenji. Uh, thank you, CSR members. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in a fortnight's time in person and on Zoom. Thank you and good night. Thank you.